Hi, Dan Alexander here, and this episode is brought to you by Required, the all-in-one go-to platform for serious recruitment professionals, owners, and founders who are looking to grow their businesses. Now, we'll actually be launching the new online platform very soon, and if you'd like to be one of the first people to get access to our state-of-the-art learning platform and vault of online resources, then get in touch with us through the link in the description of this episode. All right, welcome to the Recruiter Startup Podcast. I've got two big headers on today. I've got a co-host, not Dan Alexander today. We've subbed in Andy Hallett because we're doing our NED series. This is where we take the guys who have been there, done it, restructured things, come back for more. And we've got Matthew Parrott on today from any particular company right now. No, no, nothing, uh, nothing that I would uh, hang my hat on. I'm, in, I'm still involved with a few different bits and bobs. All right. Well, look, it's great to have you. We know all about you, but just for the for for everybody else, can you give us the your elevator pitch? Oh God. Uh, well, I'm quite old, so I've been doing this for quite a while. Um, I started in IT rec. Um, Fair means and foul. Ended up running that business. Tried to buy it. Uh, couldn't get that deal over the line. Uh, kind of ended up with uh, sort of uh, Hobson's choice. I went out on my own, uh, bought a decent FD along with me for the ride. Uh, we built uh, built up a business called Hobson Prior with some really good guys in it, very fortunately. Uh, exited that to uh, ICS Group, which is now a Casium. Uh, went in there for about a year or so, helped them with a couple of bits and bobs, did the integration, and then uh, did what uh, all fantastic recruitment founders decide they're going to do, which is retire uh, relatively early. I know I look quite old, but I've got lots of kids, which is why, uh, which is why I'm this grey. Um, spent uh, five years uh, not doing a huge amount, uh, built a house and various other bits and bobs, uh, and then um, uh, was advised by my family that it would be a good idea if I uh, uh, stopped spending quite so much time shouting at them uh, from the sidelines, uh, various uh, various matches, uh, and then uh, and then got back into uh, Got back into the business with um, some investments, bit of non-exec work, chairing uh, a, a couple of businesses, uh, and that's where I find myself today, which is um, as uh, as a ned to uh, a few portfolio businesses. Uh, some of them uh, PE backed, and uh, some of them are uh, owner managed. All right. So Matthews are one of the only few non-executive directors we allow into our founder community. We're pretty picky on that. Uh, it it is Andy's realm. He loves it. He knows all the details. What do you want to get out of today, Andy? So I think Matt, the, the the great thing is that you've been there, you've done it. So and a lot of our founders, you know, they're, they're running businesses right now. And what are the do's? What are the don'ts? Um, yeah, you know, I'm interested to know whether or not you know you set up your business to sell it, or what the inflection points are. Then when you know, right, we've got to tip this, we've got to flip this. Now I've got to come back in. What what are what are the sort of things that you're looking for, and just generally now with real sort of push, what we're seeing with working capital, just you, you've been here, you've done it. What advice would you give to people going through what it's fair to say is a bit of a squeeze right now with higher interest rates, longer DSOs? Um, what would you advise those companies to be doing? Um, well, I'd be I'd be going back about eighteen months, two years, and say uh, you know listen to people like you. Uh, listen to people that uh, that are in this group uh, who have been there and done it and and take that advice on board and actually implement it. If you haven't, uh, then you might be facing uh, some some challenges, I guess. I mean, look, c- cash is the key factor, right? Um, I think we all know that. It's a trope that goes around. But um, if you've not managed your cash and you've not conserved your cash and you've exposed yourself, then uh, especially if you've got... Um, uh, a perm heavy mix in your business, then I think you're probably facing some some difficult decisions. You've got to make those decisions quickly, right? You've got to make those decisions without emotion. Uh, you're running a business. I think um, it might have been one of the members on this group said, uh, you know, it, it's about staying in business at the moment, I think, for, for some businesses. Um, I, I'm, I'm not sure quite where we are, um, if this is another part of a cycle. Uh, mm. Certainly not... Um, Anything I've, I've previously experienced, I don't think any of us have experienced a, uh, a very low uh, level of unemployment uh, where we've still got talent shortage. So we've still got a very picky candidate base who can uh, you know, rightly pick and choose where they're going to go. Uh, but we've also got lower levels of demand. We've also got 
uh, an interest rate cycle that we're in, we're an inflation cycle that we're in, although you know, good news today from the Bank of England, they've held rates. Um, so wh wh where's it going to go? Are we going to get the interest rates down? Are we going to get the inflation rates down? Um, it's it's difficult to see that, that we're going to hit that 5% marker by the end of the year. Um, so that's going to continue to impact on cost of borrowing, which obviously if you're exposed, then you've got that cost you've got to consider. So I, I think... Uh, I think if you if you're in it right now, uh, the, the key thing is look at your cash, look at what the next three months looks like, uh, conserve your cash to deliver through that next three months, and just take it quarter by quarter because I think uh, it's a, it's a very challenging uh, space that we're in. There's lots of, there's lots of little pockets that are doing quite well, but I think you know, Duarte, you know this as much as anybody else. There's, there's quite a few uh, quite a few pain points in uh, in some of the main spaces. Yeah, do you know, I, I was doing a bit of industry research today and one of the big uh, Leeds-based businesses, Charlton Morris, uh, went uh, last week. I think they were acquired, actually, by CSG. Um, just did a bit of digging, you know, where, what, why, what, what's happened here? And top of the market stuff, stuff that you were saying, to, Andy, you were shouting to everybody when you were like, winter's coming. You've been saying this for... For a year, you've been saying it out loud. We could pull up. You're, you're always going to be right at some point, though. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I know, but like, I, I think your timing was quite apt. So instead of what happened, well, from what I hear, is big leases, big LinkedIn, and loads of graduates hired. And then your cost base is up and you're in these big contracts. And then there's a dip. And then, and then you're in trouble. We had another business. I don't forget the name of it, but. They went pop about a month ago, well-known London, London-based business. And when you look at the detail, it is that they look like a perm-heavy business, as you mentioned, Matthew. And what happens there is you're not keeping an eye on your starters. And you're like, oh, we've we've built we've built one million this month. And then you they bank it, and then that that's happened, and then counter offers happen jobs get pulled and then all of a sudden there's no money and there's nothing to pay how, how can we avoid all of this happen with strategic planning the profitable businesses can still go bust um so i remember you know back when s3 put in sap they were making about 70 million pounds a year and because we couldn't bill our clients and because um, we changed bank facility and whatever you know we were we were literally days away um from you know from from running out of cash and you know i'm sure it would have got through or sure you know there would have been some but it, it was it was literally going you know a very small thing on a on a business of that size just made such a huge difference and going from three million in the bank you know nice working capital to 40 million overdrawn within about a month and a half you know again who's going to lend but you know that's that's a real example of if you you know a very profitable business can go and I think the issue for me, and I don't know, I I just looked at the data. So, you know, deals were going really, really well. And this probably goes back to the end of Q2 last year, uh, start of Q3. But what was happening is the job flows were changing. So it, it's it, it's all, you know, and the, the, the trouble is the deals are generally the last thing to change. So actually what was actually happening was that and, and then people were like making Caesar's eyes. It's, it's a coronation. It's Easter. It's the summer holidays and using the sort of, you know, almost trying to tell themselves it's all going to be all right. And I know you shouldn't talk yourself into a recession, but just look at the data. And and that's, that's what I'd always advise. It's generally right. I, th I think there is, uh, I mean, that, that's absolutely true. Um, and, and I think you're, you're, the timing on it is, is clear, right? So it's, this is 12 months in the making, we're we're now in a position where uh, we, we've just we've just not reacted quickly enough. Uh, and as I was saying, you know, if you'd gone back a couple of years back, you'd have been looking at it and saying, "Well, look, this market is not real. This post-COVID market is simply not real." Look at all the funding that all the pent-up money that was sitting there with private equity, with venture capital. All the multi, you know, the, the huge uh, valuations that were being put on these businesses in whatever sector you were in, huge cash that was coming in, hiring like crazy, everybody looking to try and drive their numbers up. There was absolutely no way that was sustainable. And if you were looking at the data, as you say, twelve months ago, you'd have seen 
the job flows were starting to slow down quite and and actually quite dramatically towards the, the end of last year and it wasn't a seasonal thing it was just the reality of that post covid bounce dipping off and dipping off quite hard combined with all of those macroeconomic factors which none of us can control but which none of us have experienced previously in that maelstrom together so uh, i think um as i said earlier i just don't I, I don't think it's absolutely clear. I don't think anybody's got the absolute answer, but the reality is, is that if you'd been looking at the data 12 months ago, you'd have seen it coming and you could have done something about it and should have done something about it then. And so, so that I should have done something about it. You know, I, I always enjoy speaking to the guys at Rock Search because they have their model down. They, when everybody's doing a four-day week, no, we don't do that. Everybody's doing fully remote. No, we don't do that. And... Now, when the market's down, they're like, there's blood in the, sp- in the street. We're going to expand because they were looking at their data. They were in control of their, their sales processes. When others were, and I see this from a rec to perspective, they, they're, they're doing anything to get people in the door. And then when they get them in the door, they're ex- like, they all think it's going to be easy. And then we have a dip and then we have problems. And how how do you advise your sales managers that you work with to get the most out of teams uh, when whenever the data is showing you the t- t- times are going to get tougher? Well, I think I think that comes back to one of the sort of the, the the weaknesses that we have as an industry full stop, which is around performance management. You talked about having processes in place. And there are three key factors that drive revenue, right? It's process, it's the platforms you're working on, and it's the people that you've got in your business. Every single part of that needs a degree of discipline. And needs to have a performance management process behind it and if you're not committed to it as you referenced uh, one of your clients at rock if you're not committed to that consistently and and not getting distracted by shiny things you know here's the new normal four day week work remote um you know all, all the other initiatives that are going on uh, and have been talked about and lauded which are absolutely very important parts of of the world that we live in but if that's going to negatively impact your process, your platform, or the performance of your people, then you need to avoid them. So I think it it literally comes down to, do you understand what good looks like in your business? Do you have that documented and absolutely disciplined core in your business? Everybody in the business speaks the same language. Um, Andy, I I remember talking to um, uh, Russell and uh, Russell Clements uh, a few years ago and him saying that his Nirvana uh, in the S3 model was to ask somebody, how's your week? And for that person to come back to them with, well, I've got X number of jobs on, X number of candidates in pipeline, X number of first interviews, my conversion ratio from first to further is this, and my conversion of further to deal is this, so therefore I'm expecting to close this much money in the next two weeks. It is a Nirvana, right? But we've all got access to the same technology these days. Every single CRM has a reporting platform in it. Every single data analytics uh, package sits over the top, gives you that data. It's meaningless if the data is dirty. It's meaningless if people don't understand the process behind it. And it's meaningless if people aren't actually going to use it to inform what they're doing. So fundamentally, if you understand what good looks like in your business, stick to it. And if people aren't performing at the level they, they need to perform at, help them give them guidance, run a structure, run a process so that they understand it's communicated clearly. And then if they're not going to step up to the mark or they can't step up to the mark, then you've got to make those uncomfortable decisions. And those difficult decisions, those hard conversations are something that effectively for the last 10 years or so, no one's had to have really, right? Barring the COVID blip where we've had to furlough people and there was that uh, hiatus, but no one's really had to have those hard conversations because we've been in an upward trajectory pretty much for that period of time. And we've become quite soft as an industry and become very delivery centric. So who's doing 360? Who's doing BD? Who's consistently looking to leverage their clients? Who's consistently looking to add new product services in? Who's doing that? All the time you've just got 20, 30 roles coming in consistently from businesses where actually it's all about candidates. And it's important. It's an important part of it, of what we do, obviously. But if you're not consistent in your process and you don't understand what good looks like, 
you're never going to be able to get to that point, I'm afraid. And I don't think people are performance managing correctly because they don't know what they should be performance managing against. You, you make a really good point. And one of the questions I'm being asked now is how do you manage in, in a downturn? How do you manage in this market? And the answer is exactly the same way as you manage in the good times. So, you know, I think actually probably a lot of the issues we're facing now was that, you know, people were, Delta will probably say the wage inflation went through the roof. You know, the, the basic salaries went up and the fees didn't necessarily up, the billings didn't necessarily go up, but it was a bum on seat. We can take it. Therefore, we'll, you know, we've got enough jobs on, et cetera, et cetera. But the performance still didn't make that difference. And I think the companies that are really focusing on yields and even through that growth period are focusing on yield, return on investment, are the ones that are then able to say, okay, now we, we're comfortable now. We can start growing again. I think the other thing to say is there's a real sort of cognitive dissonance around People have spent, you say, the last 10 years, but certainly, you know, a, a growing a business, you know, and it's hard yards to grow with the churn we have in the industry to retain, you know, everyone sort of, you know, had that and, and then to, you know, to get to a certain amount and then drop back. It feels like no one wants to do that. Everyone wants to hold and it will be back. And, and, and it's that fear of, you know, I've got to do all this again. So I think there was a lot of people that even really confronted by data, still didn't want to do that because if the market comes back we'll be ready and you know for me I, i've never thought hope as a strategy um so yeah i think that's the the, the difference between uh, a growth model and a thrive model right so every business should be set up to grow value mm. whether, whether your whether your uh, trajectory is the, you want to build a business to exit it and you've got a you know a number in mind and the multiple in mind or whether you're just building it for a lifestyle or whether you're just building it because, you know, it's a good thing to do and you want to do that. Fundamentally, you're going to build value first and foremost. If you set it up with a view that I'm going to sell it for this much money, then you're probably not going to focus on the value drivers and the value drivers in the business should be around. How do we make sure that we can consistently deliver the yield at a desk level? And then when we get to that, then we can leapfrog, right? And we can put the next one in, and then we build that and we go again and we build that and we go again. I think if you were looking at it from a perspective of founders 15, 20 years ago, where maybe the access to capital wasn't as much, um, you know, the appetite. I mean, I remember trying to get uh, uh, a funding line in from from NatWest uh, into our business. Wouldn't take us. Right. So we funded ourselves. So we were a fully funded business running all our contractors out of our own cash. Everything. Ne never had an ID line uh, in, in the Hobson Prime business. Not because we didn't want one, we just couldn't get one uh, because we weren't deemed to be uh, credit worthy enough or whatever um, the credit committee decided at the time. Now, again, good thing. Lots and lots of options. Right? There's lots of it's broadened out. It's good, but it then creates, as you said earlier, Andy, you know, low cost creates a little bit of um, uh a sentiment that this is never going to stop. So I've got access to easy cash, cheap cash, so I can just, I can grow. And if I grow quickly and I get my head count to a certain level and I, I, I get a yield out of those at whatever, whatever number it is, and I can hit this number and I can multiply it up and I can sell it on, and I can move it forward. I think that misses the, 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 the key point, which is, well, how do you, how do you consistently build and scale a business and replicate good if you don't know what good is? And you're not, you don't have that process embedded and uh, the discipline in place in the business to, to get it going in the right direction. So uh, I think there are, there are challenges afoot for everyone. That, that self-funding model actually would have protected your business. So the, the thing is, when you're self-funding contractors and you start losing contractors, it throws cash back into your business. So what you're actually finding now is where, you know, 99% of firms are actually using an ID line. It actually, all they're losing is, is you know, they're, they're losing that profitability. They're losing that turnover, that rev. And the big thing I'm seeing um, right now um, from our funding partners um, and across the groups is that obviously the cost of working capital has gone up massively, you know, with interest rates going from 0.1 of 1% a year ago to 5.25. And, you know, thank goodness for businesses that stayed the same today. Agency margins aren't going up um, and you're unable to, you know, and maybe some firms are able to pass that on to the customer, but, you know, and, and bowl accounts from the, from the funders, the DSOs have rocketed up 
in this last year as as end customers want to preserve their cash. So you know it, it's 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 agencies that are getting squeezed in the middle. Matthew, tell us a little bit about uh, your journey with SEC. Um, so uh, got approached by the then PE house uh, to see whether I'd be interested in uh, doing a one day a month non-exec chair come in uh, and help with uh, a bit of strategy realization um and uh that was in back into 2019 um i suppose the realization dawned that the business was uh challenged uh to say the least uh, in a number of areas uh and uh making a change was going to be necessary if um uh if the investors were going to get um going to get their interest let alone uh, let alone their capital back um so uh i was very fortunate i bought in uh, uh my business partner our cfo stuart gold up uh who's uh, uh been around uh, nearly as long as me um and um we um set about trying to help the business to to, to get where it needed to get to uh and to uh, put some processes and change in um and then let me take a step uh, back. What, yeah, yeah. What, what does the analysis look like? Okay, I mean, they're going, hey, we need our money. Like, well, well get in there, have a look. Like, what, what happens next? Like, uh, well, um, what, what happens is that, uh, so uh, when I first started working with, uh, with, with, with private equity uh, firms, uh, I was vetted. Sorry, I'm just going to give hmm. you a bit of a tangent. I was oh, vetted. Oh, no, that's good. For, like, uh, for break you, you, you've, ne- you've never chaired a private equity firm, uh, uh, backed firm before. Um, are you good enough? So uh, what we're going to do is we're going uh, to give you a mentor and you're going to do some sessions with, with, with a mentor, which is a senior, uh, senior chair uh, within the PE portfolio. And um, they're going to spend, you know, going to spend a couple of hours a week with them over the course of you know six to six to eight weeks and they're going to make sure that you're you're up and running you know what you're doing etc um so i had the first session um with uh with this chap and after about half an hour or so he said this is a complete waste of time we can we could you know just ask me questions and i said okay so the first question is what are these guys looking to do uh and uh, and he said to me look in, in the nicest possible way these are very very smart people sitting in a room trying to work out how they can very nicely screw everybody in that business for as much money as they can. So that's the background to when you're working with these, with PE guys, right? And and what do they want? They, they want their money, right? They want their return on investment and they want their pound of flesh. And there's lots of different types of businesses and you know they, they, they will have different drivers, but fundamentally they've got to make a return for their shareholders, right? Yeah. So the analysis is, is, is relatively straightforward to, 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 to undertake. This business isn't delivering what it needs to deliver. It's failing. It's, it's not going to get to a point where it's delivering enough EBIT to get a multiplier in to get your investment back out or anything like what you're expecting to get out of it. So let's have a candid conversation around what do you actually think you can achieve and what's the time frame within which you you want to achieve that um pretty much the same type of conversation i would have with uh with with an owner of a business is what do you want to achieve and in what time frame because we need to we need to put some ground rules down right um and so, so that's the background to it and then it's lots of conversations around what's the best route what's the best course of action and most private equity firms don't like taking management teams out of the businesses they buy because fundamentally they don't know how to run the business themselves unless they've got a ready-made management team that can step in who's going to run the business Mm. so they're very loath to take those people out which is good from one perspective but it's also it, it creates a degree of risk for them if they don't fundamentally understand the sector in which uh the uh, the company's operating and there's a lot of sort of general uh uh generalist investors into the space who don't really understand the nuances of the sector as well as they might uh as well as they should uh, and they don't do their due diligence as much as they should either um which is um you know something that, that they need to work on as much as we need to work on as an industry um so the, the conversations were very much we want this can it be achieved like this our advice as the non-execs in the business were, well, actually having seen it and done it before, this needs to happen if you want to get to there. And these are the consequences. Uh, and it's entirely up to you whether whether you want to do that. But if you do, you need to understand the upsides and the downsides. So it's 
no different than any form of like uh, business proposition. Literally looking at it from the point of view of what's the risk, what's the gain, and are we going to get what we want to get out of it? Uh, so that was the conversation, uh, and that was the process that we went through. The decision was made that they needed to make a fundamental change in the business to change the direction of the narrative of it. Uh, that was done. A um, few market challenges have then obviously ensued as we've all been going through. So operationally, uh, that business has, um, has been struggling to get to where it needs to get to. Uh, so we have further conversations with uh, with our investors. We explain the realities of the world, very open, very transparent. This is where you are. This is what you can expect. This is what you can achieve. What do you want to do? Uh, and uh, and then you put a plan in and you and you, and you go for it. So we've just undertaken a refinancing into into that SEC business. Uh, we brought in uh, new funders. Um, we've uh, we've helped our investors to um, uh, uh, remove uh, the bulk, if not all, of their debt burden into the business, which is good from from the company's perspective. And uh, and these guys have uh, have also agreed to. Um, uh, take uh, take quite a significant haircut on their equity as well because they're they're confident that the plan of action, which might take a little while, right, to come to fruition, but the plan of action will see them getting a return that they would otherwise not have got uh, on a business that was rapidly heading towards uh, a a very challenging decision that it needed to make. Yeah, you've you've spared you've spared a few um, um, sort of obviously details there, and I um, but. I guess the sort of takeaway from that is it, it's just got to be, you've just got to be upfront and honest. There's no point messing around, you know, telling people what they want to hear. You've just got to give it to them straight that this is, this is the reality of the situation. You know, it, you can't, you can't sort of fluff that. You've, you've absolutely got to tell them as it is. And actually this is the clear plan that we're going to take this forward. Uh, and, and that's that that's, 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 best to choose you, Matt, Matt, Matt. Do you think they were looking for that in the meeting? Um, potentially, uh, it, it, that may well have been a reputation that uh, that preceded me uh, in terms <laughs> of being quite quite direct. Look, I, I think the role of a non-exec right is to um, is to is to ask the questions that management do not want to be asked. And as long as you're clear and transparent about that from the get go, I, I think that is that is a key fundamental for for a Ned. Um, I bought a I bought a Ned in to uh, to, to Hobson Pry when we were a tiny little business, right in the grand scheme of things. Yeah, you know, nothing, nothing really, but uh, you know, small business. But we bought. Well, we were very lucky to bring a guy in called Zach Miles, who was um, uh, just uh, just exited from Randstad as their uh, as their CEO. Uh, he was a CEO at Video Group, been around the industry for a long time, built businesses, acquired businesses, I think did something like 50 acquisitions. Really, really good guy. And we got introduced to him and he came into us and I hated having the meeting with him. I really liked him, but I hated having a meeting with him because I absolutely knew he was going to just ask me the questions I didn't want to answer. And it was a real discipline to say, I'm paying this guy to come in and basically haul me over the coals as a business owner um, and 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 put and make me feel uncomfortable about decisions that I might have taken or that I might be considering taking um, and, and just challenging me uh, in, 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 you know, in, a, in a really positive way. And, and um, I think that's the role of a, of a good Ned. It's to once you understand what journey that business wants to go on or is on. And the owners and the shareholders are aligned in terms of what they want to achieve because that's really critical, right? Because I don't know, Andy, you've seen it, Duarte, you must have seen it as well. Shareholders wanting different things out of uh, out of the business once they've you know once they've set it up. Uh, I think if if everybody's aligned around it, then that then that's great, right? But no one wants to have those groundhog days where you, you, you come into a meeting, you agree a set of actions, everybody's agreed on it, and then you come back, you know, four weeks later, and no one's done anything. Right, that's the job of the net is to say why have you not done that? We agreed that that was a strategic imperative. Why have you not done it? And do you understand what impact that's going to have in terms of you getting where you want to get to? And that's the key thing. I think that's that's the fundamental job of a net is to say why have you not done what you said you were going to do? Because as business owners, and we've all been there, we're all there, right? It's really easy to get sidetracked. Don't see the wood for the trees. 
lots of other things come into play. You get, you know, distracted by all sorts of things. I think that's one of the biggest challenges the last couple of years. I think people have just been distracted because there's been lots and lots of shiny things that people have been attaching value to. Uh, and they've been led to believe that that can crystallize into helping them to get to where they want to get to quicker. But, you know, then that ignores the fundamentals of a staffing business, which is pretty bloody simple, really, right? As I said earlier, good process, good platform, good people. And if you've got a decent performance management structure in that sits around all of those, shouldn't really have a problem. Markets come and go. Absolutely. There's always challenges. Macroeconomic factors, you can't influence those. They're always going to be there. Set your business up with being mindful of the fact that it's going to be days like today and you know the periods that we're in now. That's your bedrock. That's your standard, right? It's bloody hard. There's not enough work out there. You've got to distinguish yourself. And the disciplined businesses are the ones that get through it and thrive. And that thriving element is what will allow them to create value. And it's the value, ultimately, that an acquirer is going to look for. It doesn't, it doesn't necessarily need to be that big. We sold Hobson Pryor, and it was 18 billers in the business at the time. Right? It doesn't need to be big to be valuable, right? And we did all right out of it. And we did all right out of it in the 10-year in the journey that we took it on as well, right? So you can have a good ride in the journey, and you can get a good outturn at the end of it. And, and and that can continue and consist of, I mean, I, I'm working with a fantastic uh, group of guys that are building a business and they've just stuck to their model, stuck to their operating process. There's about 15 of them now, right? And their, their EBIT is like one and a half million. They're not rinsing the business. They've got decent process in place. They've bought good people in, but they're performance managing them consistently. They've got the right tech platforms in ultimately, you know, to jig around with that. Um, you know, they they listen to the advice that they get given, not just by me, but by, uh, you know, other people who are helpful in their business, that lawyers, et cetera. But they listen to those people and they implement. And then when you go in and have a meeting with them, they've, they've done what they said they were going to do in the period of time in which they said they were going to do it. It's, it's not, it's not, I, I'm not doing that. They're doing that. All I'm doing every now and again is coming in and saying, have you considered that? Why don't you do that? If we agree that, can we deliver that? Fantastic. Let's do that. Really, really simple. But that business, you know, on, I don't know, when do you want to pick a multiplier point on, right? 12 months ago, they've probably got 15 times for it or some stupid valuation like that at that point in time. But, um, you know, that business is a really valuable business and it's creating a fantastic environment and a quality of life for everybody that's involved in it. And they're doing a great job for their clients, great job for their candidates. What's not to like? I think I think the other thing I'd just add to what I think Aned brings, and I've I've seen it when I've, you know, when we've brought in experts into boards that I've been on, but also I think when what I've tried to replicate when I've been on boards is is that decision making. Um, you actually force a decision. Um, the only thing worse than a bad decision is no decision. So what I tended to find is you talk about a subject and, okay, so what are the clear actions from this? And then you talked about that that action because it's a nice conversation, but are we just going to leave it at that? Are we going to monitor it? Are we going to come back? What's the, and, and then as you say, next month, it's holding that to account um, around the, we said we were going to do this. Did we do it or didn't we? And and I think actually that's what having you, you talked about that accountability is often you know we, we see it from um, a lot of our um, certainly our startup group they don't often have that level of accountability so you know they they might in their first year go and build 150k which is great you know probably double what they would have made you know if they if they but you know is anyone there on their shoulder saying well if you'd have if you'd have just done 50k more that would have all dropped through nicely and you'd be a lot further on you could have hired someone else you could so you know they don't necessarily have that accountability around being pushed um and i think that's what that external advice that sort of parrot on your shoulder of you know what's matt going to say what's andy going to say really does help and uh, matt just a question just around non-executive directors for people that might be wondering you know how, how does that work is like I'm not asking for your pricing, but just generally when you're when you're engaging with non-executive directors, do, do you have to give them equity in your business, or do they become a chairman? Is it a day rate? Is it a like? Is it a mixture of all the above? Uh, how should you? How careful should you be in how you go about this? 
Well, you, you should be careful, right? Um, because <laughs> equity is very expensive. So, you know, don't start dishing it out like uh, like candy. And um, I, I, I would advise uh, anybody not to not to start considering equity uh, until you're very comfortable with that individual uh, and you want them to be part and parcel of your journey over a longer period of time. And you can kind of share some of the risk reward side of things. Um, so, it, look, it should be, uh, for me, it should be get to know you, right? Day rate few months understand one another's strengths and weaknesses because not every not everybody's going to be right for everybody else i'm certainly you know an acquired taste i think according to my wife um so i think you, you know you, you, going on a day rate um fix a schedule for that and then if it's if it's all tickety boo sign a slightly longer contract uh move to whatever structured payment cycle really works for everybody um and then uh and then if it is a journey that everybody's going to be on then you can have that conversation around you know uh uh equity and whether that's a you know bit of bought in bit of sweet bit of sweat you know however you, however you flex it um if you as you would do if you want good people in your business right you, you're going to want them to have a piece of it because you, you're going to want to make sure that they stay with you for the journey and they're going to benefit from the upside and they all see a bit of a longer term play so um yeah, it, it 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 can go in in any of those directions, and and again, depending on where you are in the cycle, right? So, mm-hmm. um, some of the you know so, some of the some of the work I do is with companies that are quite away through their cycle, um, and they they just they want somebody to come in and kick the tires for a due diligence perspective, see what you can get to around a deal uh, deal process. Well, if that's the case, then you know maybe some kind of you know deal related bonus is 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 a, is better for everybody concerned. So. How you slice and dice it is, is depending on where you are in the cycle and and uh, and 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 how uh, how long term the commitment needs to be. But um, I would one hundred percent convince and say to everybody: do not start offering equity uh, to people from day one because it's it's very expensive ultimately. Are you able to speak just a little bit on? Uh, you mentioned being vetted by PE and having that relationship and. There's only X amount of ne'er to have that kind of pull with the private equity houses. Do, does the private equity house come to you and say, hey, can you go and find a company and like shape it for me? Or do you are you a net and then you're like talking to the private equity company? Where 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 are you guys at in your in your in your buying cycle? I, this is what who I'm working with now. I think we're going to be at this. Like what, what is that what does that courting process look like? Um, I, I look, I, I, I'm not sure there's necessarily a, a structure, and there, are, and just to be clear, there are a, a lot of guys that are a lot closer to to a broader base of, of PEs than uh, than I am. I tend to work with some of the small to medium sized ones, um, but but fundamentally, it's you, you get onto a, a you know, it's it's all about network. Right? Mm. You get you get introed in uh, how uh, how these last guys, uh, the SEC guys, found me. Is a sort of you know circuitous route, but you know we we sold HP to ICS, which was an uh, PE back business. So there's a little bit of um, uh, a sort of visibility there. Uh, you know, you, you connect with people, you meet and you bump into them. People refer you to other people, and that's re- literally how it is. It's a network piece. And then once you get on the inside, then you get then you get tapped on the shoulder. Can you give us a bit of advice for this? We're looking at this business. Can you help us with that? okay great you know so sometimes you'll do a bit of work for them and and it'll be okay this is what you know this is my advisory piece and then they might come back to you and say oh you know can you help us through this process and then that might crystallize into uh something slightly more long term or 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 it might not um so uh, there there isn't a one uh, a one route process it's fundamentally network do you understand what PE is looking for can you help them do they like you uh do they trust you um which um, you know, it's a staffing industry, right? Trust, yeah, right. Trust, <laughs> a, tr- tr- trust, trust, a big issue, right? What do you think about that, Andy? Yeah, it, it, it's interesting to sort of observe that um, the sort of you know the world of PE. It, it seems like quite a closed shop, and I think, but it's it, it used to be like um, you know, tech consultants getting into banking. They'd phone you up and say, I want to go and work for a banking. Like, have you worked in banking? It's like, no. So it's like, it's, it's almost, it has, you have to be part of something to get in. And then I think once you're in, you end up on some deal cycles um, and you, you're sort of in that, in that world. But, um, you know, from, from the outside, it certainly does look very, very mysterious, but um, I guess it's like, 
most businesses you know once you understand the rules of the game it's a, it's a people thing it's a you know it's a trust thing once you've executed correctly for you know firm they're going to trust you to do it again trust your advice that bit more and you know it, it becomes a sort of virtuous cycle yeah i mean it, it, it is about trust right as you said previously it's about you know being very clear in your communication and not not sugarcoating anything i think if you're honest with whoever you're dealing with um pe being you know being uh being no exception just 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 being very direct and very honest uh with them uh, is is really important i think you know we we're all um uh all guilty of believing our own bullshit every now and again and i think that uh if you can cut through that uh, with these guys they're serious guys right they're there to make a lot of money they make their upside on their carry they want the they want the investments to be successful they're not sitting there trying to you know derail businesses or change management teams they want a nice easy ride as much as they can possibly get uh if you can help them with that if you can grease grease that process uh then uh, then they're going to be comfortable with you and they're going to want to work with you um uh through uh through that cycle and potentially uh into others as i said i think there are not that many uh staffing specialist investors uh in the pe world that is quite a closed shop and they've got a very small cohort of people that they trust consistently to to do it and when you move into the you know the upper echelons you know uh, uh, i count uh, uh i count the guy that uh, that bought our business as a, as a friend and you know he's he's taken that business through significant PE cycles right um and um uh and and he's very trusted to do that because he's been refinancing in the hundreds of millions uh and um they 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 understand he knows what needs to happen right so he's going to be top of the call sheet yeah. for a business of that size uh, it's when you come down to the uh you know championship and league one uh, <laughs> league one level that uh yeah. you know so, so maybe, maybe even some non-league as well that um yeah. uh, that uh, that you get a different uh, different profile of business Fantastic. Well, guys, I think that's just, awesome. Just, just one last thing. Um, sorry to interrupt you, Mister Mister Co-host. Um, but do you think we're going to see quite a few deals now with some? You know, you, you, there's some quite quite good value in the market um, potentially with you know founders that probably a year ago thought they were going to get out, almost had their towel on the deck, chair ready to go, and you know, but now like actually do i fancy a rebuild now you know it's going to be to get back to that level maybe three four years maybe who knows um do you do you think that there's value in the market right now uh yeah there will i suppose where, where's the inflection point right i mean you Jamati, you referenced a business that uh, unfortunately um uh stopped trading uh, recently uh, you know decent business 100 people at, at, at its peak um you know good balance sheet um profitable uh but just ran out of cash right just over, overextended itself on, on things it probably shouldn't have been uh overextending itself on um so it, it, as, as an investor if you're looking at it, you're taking a back seat dispassionately it's like well, what, when's a business going to get to that level and that's you know that that's when it's the, the that's when the uh the, the real value is to be had so i think there's a little bit more pain to be to be experienced uh i don't uh, unfortunately i don't think um that, that that company will be the last that we'll see uh of businesses uh over the course of the next uh few months i think there's some businesses out there that are loaded with quite a lot of debt uh and uh, i think they're going to struggle to make their covenants uh for some of them uh and um those bigger businesses are going to be you know potentially good value either as trade pickups uh secondary pe's um distressed asset buyers and you know there's there's quite a few distressed asset buyers out in there uh, in the market today uh, and they're just going to be waiting and you know a, a little bit more uh, to see uh, to see how these guys fare over the course of uh, the, the the next few months so uh, th there's there's definitely value to be had um, there might be even more value to be had uh, if you're prepared to to sweat out over the course of the next few months I think all right I want I want some good news now don't be talking to me about distressed assets <laughs> for God's sake Andy how could you finish it on that you're killing me here September surge, how the how the deal flow is going, you know. So, what's your requirements looking like? You know, that's 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 in the reality. You know, the the, the advice now is, you know, which ones your consultants aren't yielding. What do the job flows look like? And you know, actually, you want to start growing when those yields are, you know, but because you don't then want to be left behind. I think one of the things is don't try and chase the cycle um, because you're always six months too late. You know, mm. just try and just try and stay ahead. And if that's growing, 
um, then then you know grow because your data tells you to. If that's it's not so good. Recruitment companies are very bad at holding, but that might mean taking a backward step as well. So um, I think what I'm seeing, I don't know if you've seen a September surge, but certainly around my advisories, they're a lot more confident. You know, now the summer breaks over, you know, there, there tends to be this, you know, there is a talent shortage in STEM, as we well know. So no one's knocking out the park, but I think they're a lot more confident this month. It- Definitely September's a more confident uh, position than it was uh, this time last month. Uh, and I think uh, ho- hopefully... It's not good ho- this time last month. Well, there, there you go. Uh, I think the uh, I think the uh, the interest rate hold is going to help as well, right? Uh, that might give us a little bit more uh, confidence and, and maybe we've, you know, we've hit the hit the peak on that and it's going to start to come off and, you know, uh, inflation's dipping off a little bit as well. So those macro factors might, uh, might start to help. But I think you're absolutely right, Andy. It's like, you know, hold you know holding and thriving even even shrinking a little bit is probably a pretty good outcome for a lot of businesses uh, yeah. at the moment so um you know uh, st- stay in business to be in business right on a on a positive note to to finish up do you, do you know the analogy of like professional footballers sending their their kids to like the, the best academies matthew here is guilty of doing this with his son and um, he sent them off was it Faden? He became a killer. He sharpened they sharpened the store the, the sword somewhere else. Now he's at SEC. And you must be hopeful for the future of our industry if if you've got the if you've got the young man involved. Well, I'm I'm hopeful for maybe possibly getting a pension, which would be uh, which would be quite nice out of it. Uh, return on the investment. Exactly, I'd like a return on some of that investment. But uh, no, look, you, you, there 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 are some uh, there are some. Great businesses out there that are breeding some really, really good people. You know, the S three model of building, you know, breeding people that go out and and build their own businesses and 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 create you know uh, m- multiple value. Fain are doing the same thing. There's a couple, you know, there's a few other businesses that have been doing the same thing as well. And I think you know those businesses that have got fantastic training grounds where you know they don't take a backward step. It's process centric. They know what good looks like and it's disciplined. Those are the places that people are going to learn their their trade properly, and are going to set them. You know, will be set good for moving forward. And I think um, you know those businesses should be applauded for for doing that because actually that's the positive about our industry, right? It's those businesses that really understand how to give value to clients, value to candidates, and the value to the people that are in their businesses, and don't take a backward step from it, and you know don't get distracted by uh, by anything else. And if only there was an online platform about to be released, that's distill all of this into one actionable piece that's a really good idea we should look at that (laughs) more more on our new platform that will be out hopefully by the new year but the beta will happen soon matthew we'd love to get you involved in the beta of it and uh, see if you could give us uh, the opinion of your staff and so we can make it even better love to help all right guys thanks Thanks, so much thanks guys